favorite trainer with a belt buckle. Today, we're gonna help you pass the CSCS with a sneak peek into our online internship. We can help you pass the CSCS two months. We have a guest speaker today, Dr. Andy Galpin, and he's gonna help you better understand bioenergetics. And that's what we're all about, about show up fitness, is get in front of the right professors and doctors and strength coaches and therapists and registered dietitians that's what we provide with our internship that's online. We can get you to pass the CSCS. Most importantly, get into a proper internship and mentorship so you can make this into a career. And if you haven't read the book, check it out. How to Become a Successful Trainer. We have a lot of successful strength coaches in there. Check out this video. Get into the classes all over the world. I guess where do you want me to start? Where, where would you like in your intro classes that you would teach? Like if you were to have, you know, a 30 minute little session and people, you know, someone were to raise their hands, you know, I'm really trying to understand bioenergetics. Can you, yeah, can okay. You, I know that's so, such a hard loaded question, right? But, <laughs> right. All right. Um, I would say this to get the full picture, you can go to a number of the videos you referenced earlier on my YouTube page. And I would even include the video series on training for endurance. All right, this is really, cause this is really what we're talking about. The energetic systems pay very little relevance for things like peak vertical jump. Um, so it, it's, it's really an issue of maintaining work over time is where energetics come into place. And then why that's relevant is when you're preparing an athlete or an individual, you need to make sure that you're training them in what we call the right energy system for the sport or the engagement they're going to be participating in. And so that's why understanding these things becomes relevant is to make sure that you're preparing them typically for conditioning based purposes, even a power sport that has to be repeated multiple times. The same thing holds true. Uh, I guess the largest overview is bioenergetics itself is, is it's simply a term of understanding how we create energy for physical work. And you could plot this across two ways. So the first way would be, um, where are you getting the energy from? And then the second one is, how is that energy being created or utilized for physical work? And so at the most basic level, energy is coming from your macronutrients, which is for the most part, carbohydrates and fat. And so if you look at this as, think of this as a funnel. Everything is going to be kind of swirling in your body. It's going to go in your stomach. It's going to come out your stomach into your, um, into your blood and, and move throughout its way. And eventually it's going to go into muscle. Now, once it's in the muscle, then it has to then be used to create energy. And so all that's going to swirl around in this giant funnel. And that's basically going to be carbohydrates and fat. And they're going to go through there. So the question then becomes, how do we use those two, two items to make energy? And the easiest way to think about this is at the very beginning, uh, you have what we call a phosphocreatine or um, PCR system, right? So HVPCR is how it's usually accumulated, right? So in that simple equation, you're taking phosphocreatine or creatine and you're basically using a one-to-one -one exchange. So one molecule of creatine creates one molecule of this energy. And we'll get to what this energy thing is later. Um, that is stored intrinsically in the muscle and it is used so the muscle you're using is a muscle that's being burned. So if you're contracting your bicep, you're using the phosphocreatine stored in the muscle fibers in your bicep directly. Right now, um, that is not energy for phosphocreatine is not coming from carbohydrates or fat. It's a little bit unique. It comes from its own storage. So it's, it's made within the muscle. That one throws the analogy off a little bit. But outside of that, as you start to continue need to repeat that, in general, you're going to move to using carbohydrates, and you can use carbohydrates in two primary ways. The first one is called anaerobic, and it's called that because anaerobic means without an, typically before word means without, and aerobic typically means oxygen. So the anaerobic system means you're able to create energy without needing oxygen. It doesn't matter if oxygen is there, it can be present, but it's just simply irrelevant to the equation. So it's not necessary, it can be there, it can be not irrelevant. So the anaerobic system is a little bit better than phosphocreatine in the sense that uh, it can create a little bit more energy per molecule. Uh, so one carbohydrate comes in and you can get three or four things of energy where phosphocreatine, it's one to one, um, but it's not much better. So instead of 
burning out after a couple of seconds, it's going to give you maybe some seconds to a couple of minutes of energy. And so think of this as something that you're going to use during like um, interval training, right? So you got to have burst for 20 seconds. You're going to run out of phosphocreatine in a couple of seconds, and you're going to take a break and you're going to do that again. Eventually, you're going to have to turn towards carbohydrate because the energy demand is simply too high. The downside is um, the carbohydrates you use for anaerobic energy or anaerobic glycolysis, as we call it, uh, are coming also from the, the muscle that's being directly contracted. And the total amount of carbohydrates that you can simply store in your muscle is limited. I mean, think about it. Your muscle's only this big or that big or however big it is. There's just only so much carbohydrate that can be stored in there. And so the other byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis is the end result of that process creates um, mechanisms that call, cause fatigue. Think of this as like it causes acid. It's not really what work, how it works, but if that's what helps you think of it for now. And so it is fast energy, it is short lasting and high fatigue. Okay, well, great. If I have to sprint 30 seconds and save myself from being uh, attacked by a mountain lion or something, right? But I can't simply sustain that output over minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes of time. I'm gonna have to have a different strategy. So if you continue to work past that, say 30 seconds and you ran say half a mile, Inner meters, something I it was a couple of minutes, two or three or four. You're going to have to switch over to, to the aerobic side. And we're still using carbohydrates. We're still going through glycolysis, but now aerobic meaning it requires oxygen. And so you simply have to have the time to inhale, bring in oxygen, get the oxygen from your mouth into your throat, down to your lungs, exchange it across your lungs, take it from your lungs into your blood, put it in your blood, move it to the exercising muscle get it into the exercising muscle, get it into the mitochondria and help that make energy. And so it's simply a slower process. It's more effective. You get way more mitochondria or way more energy out of it. Um, you know, tenfold more energy per molecule of carbohydrate. But the downside is it's much slower, right? Remember the anaerobic glycolysis can simply be created right then in the exercising muscle. So less fatigue, but slower. And so energetics are built or not built, but they're we're fortunate in the fact that they, they exist in a way that allows you to do anything you want to do, but everything has a pro and a con, right? So whatever type of physical exertion you need, you have the ability to create energy, sustain that. It's just downsides. So we're still simply talking about using carbohydrates as a fuel source. If you continue past that point, uh, now you can start to mobilize and utilize fat as a fuel source. And fat is not coming, well, much of it, some, some small amounts, but very little is coming from the amount of fat stored in your muscle. It's coming from the amount of fat you have stored everywhere else. So this is the first time we've departed now from this idea of energy coming directly from the contracting muscle. So fat utilization comes from everywhere throughout the body, which is why when somebody loses fat, you know, after four or five months of exercise and nutrition, it's not like they use fat, lose fat only from the exercising muscle. It comes, you know, somewhat equally from that the entire body. That's not the case for carbohydrate use. It's not the case for uh, phosphocreatine use. So the downside of fat is, again, it is purely aerobic and has to be mobilized from the back of your neck and your wrist and your ankle and your toe and hamstring. Move from there, put into blood, move throughout the blood, up, take, taken up in the muscle, taken into the mitochondria, and then it creates even a tenfold greater amount of energy on top of that. Now, the energy that all of those systems create is called ATP. And that's the only energy currency, not only within exercise, but within the entire human body and within all of biology. So anything that's alive has to make ATP. That's the only thing we're aware of that can be used to create cellular energy. So it's all going to the exact same end place. We simply have an ability to use that. Um, now, the amount of carbohydrate you have stored is fairly limited because it's, again, coming from directly from the exercising muscle. Or if you need a backup, your liver actually stores quite a bit as well. And so you can break it down in your liver, put it into your blood, blood will circulate around and the muscle will take it out of the blood kind of as it moves by. But your liver, again, it's only, you know, yay big. So fat storages are unlimited. And, and you know, just look around. We can see that's clearly the case of the amount of fat that you can store is out there. So fat is really best served as a energy supply for backup reserve. So when you start to burn past your total ability to use carbohydrate, you have this unlimited supply of reserve, as well as something to sustain us during very low 
intensity. By, by that, we mean very slow demand for fuel. So what you're doing right now, sitting around, sleeping, there's, there's no need for speed here. So why burn our limited supply of carbohydrates when we can use this unlimited supply of fat? So that's in general how bioenergetics work. Um, and it's just to wrap this thought up and then I can go back in any place or move on. Um, is when you're talking about training an individual athlete, we need to understand the demands of the sport or the activity that they're in. And then we need to make sure that we're deploying the type of training that will improve the functionality of any of these systems. And so if we look at this uh, and you compare, you know, an American football player to uh, a 5K runner to a, an ultra endurance athlete, it, it's, it's quite critical that the energy systems they need for their different activities are trained appropriately so that they can develop the mechanisms needed to do that. And what I'm kind of jibbling around saying is every one of these systems are quite adaptable. And so if you want to optimize fat burning, that's great. You can do that. And if you train those systems, you'll get better. But that's going to come with the consequence, probably, of the anaerobic side of the equation, which for an ultra marathon, fine. You don't really need to be super fast for 20 seconds, but you need sustained energy over a long period of time. If you optimize the fat end of the spectrum and you're working with an individual like the American football player, it's going to come with the consequence of physical speed. And so that, that is a downside of training in long sustained methods, because now you're probably, you're probably undercutting your ability to uh, go through anaerobic glycolysis in summary. So this is why proper training interventions are, are important. And this is why understanding these um, systems, even at the most fundamental level, um, provides you a greater scientific back and the rationale for what the type of training you're doing with your athlete. Was that exactly. hoping kind of your yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, we, we address a lot of that with like NSCA's needs analysis and you look at bioenergetics, you look at injuries yeah. that are common and muscle actions and so forth. And just a little clarification from and just to from my own end as well. When we talk about the the end product of some people call it fast glycolysis. I usually refer to it as anaerobic. Yeah. I don't, you know, but that acid that we're talking about, I know some people will get into the whole lactic acid. Some people will talk about lactate. And can you just give us some clarification on the conversion? If, if I'm understanding correctly, it's essentially lactate, lactic acid is, is produced and then very quickly it's converted to lactate and, and how that plays a role into that burning sensation that we may be feeling. Yes, so it depends on how long I'm gonna go here, but um, the quick answer is, um, okay, I'll, I'll do it the, was that kind of kind of close? Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> close close enough, close enough for science. Uh, so when you're going through anaerobic glycolysis, or when you're going through glycolysis periods, so glycolysis, lysis. Anytime you hear that uh, phrase, it just means splitting or breaking. Glyco is referring to glycogen or carbohydrate molecule, right? Well, most of the time you're going through this, you're going to be using glucose, and so glucose is blood sugar. It's the same sort of thing that you need to think about. Um, that is a molecule comprised of six carb. In fact, what we call it a carbohydrate is because those molecules are simply six carbon chains with one hydrogen or with one water molecule each. So it's a carbon that has been hydrated. This is one carbon, one water, one carbon, one water. That's all it is. So you got six carbon molecules. Now, when you go through this anaerobic glycolysis, you're splitting that um, six carbon molecule into two separate three carbon molecules. Okay, we call those pyruvate. Now, that splitting, anytime you split an atom, you're either going to use energy or provide energy. In this particular case, it provides energy. It's called extragonic. So it gives off additional energy. That's the energy you're using to then go create that ATP I was talking about. So that's it. So it's very small from just a single break. Well, now you've got these two, three carbon pyruvate molecules that you have floating around. And for various chemi chemistry reasons, um, it's not really happy that way. And so what you're going to immediately need to do is um, ship those into the mitochondria and turn those into acetyl-CoA, which are two carbon molecules, and run those things through the Krebs cycle. And that's the entire oxidative side. Um, that would be in the mitochondria. That would be the aerobic side of the equation, or the slow glycolysis. Is referred to. Right. So coming back to the three carbon molecules by Rube, um, they're not going to sit around that way. And so what you're going to have to do is attach a hydrogen ion. And hydrogen is synonymous with acid. 
free floating hydrogen, that's why we call it pH, it's potential hydrogen. That's what that means. So if there's a lot of potential for hydrogen, and there's a small potential for hydrogen, that's a higher or low pH, right? And you know, high pH versus low pH acid base, right? So what the pyruvate is going to do is absorb one of those hydrogen molecules. And a pyruvate that has a hydrogen molecule attached to it is now called lactate. So it's a very, very similar thing. So um, I honestly don't worry too much about the differentiation between lactate and lactic acid. It's exactly like you said, it's, it's, and it's not a big deal. It happens almost instantaneously. Uh, I think the more relevant part of the conversation is, one, what happens with the lactate? And is that causing my fatigue? And so the answer to what happens to the lactate is, is numerous. One, it can then be reconverted right back into sugar and used as fuel in the muscle. It can be shipped out of the muscle into the blood and sent to another exercise or another muscle that's not being exercised. It can then reconvert that back into pyruvate, put that back into sugar and store it. So it's a fantastic fuel source. It can be shipped to the heart. Heart is amazing at using it directly as fuel. It can be shipped to the liver and it can also be shipped to the brain. And the brain loves lactate as a fuel, loves it. Hmm. And this is one of the reasons why um, you'll see folks do things like you'll perform better during finals week if you exercise. And the reason is um, lactate is quite productive as a fuel for your brain. So this is why memory goes up, cognition goes up, all these things in, are enhanced when, when people exercise. Um, but it's not just like a magic, right? Yeah. There's, there's chemistry reasons, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the last part to round out the conversation is, as lactate is just simply thought of as a fatigue inducing molecule, uh, it's just not true. I guess is the most blunt way to put it. So is it relevant to the conversation? Yeah. As fatigue accumulates, will lactate accumulate? Most definitely. But that is a failure of understanding causation versus correlation. So the two things are going up at the same time, but one is not causing the other. Mm. So we have other mechanisms that we know causing the fatigue. Um, and they have to do with a bunch of things you really probably don't care about at this point. Um, if you go back, if you get to the part of learning uh, and uh, like a CSCS prep about the sliding filament theory and the role of calcium, um, the role of the uh, phosphagen in that system, those are probably explaining a lot of it, as well as um, the acid produced from the things like ATP hydrolysis. So eventually when you make that ATP a molecule, you got to split that. That actual process generates a ton of, of acid. So those are probably the things that are causing more fatigue than, than the lactate. It's just simply when we started measuring these things back in the day, we would notice, hey, at this level of fatigue, very low, there's less level of lactate. At this moderate level of fatigue, there's a moderate level of lactate. And now, geez, really high levels of fatigue high levels. So it seems to be that these things are just one or one. Therefore, lactate is probably what's causing fatigue. And that's, um, in fact, the original way that they found this was they were taking blood work from stags. So the, this is the, the, the undulate, the, you know, what we would more look like as a deer over here. Uh, in Germany, they're, they're stags. So I think it was German. And they just simply noticed, wow, uh, if we had to chase and hunt one down, that lactate was really, really high. And if it was not, then it was really low. So fatigue and these things are being caused by lactate. And it sort of just carried there for a couple hundred years until we realized that's not actually what's happening. So yeah, so it's, I guess the one way to think about it, I guess to summarize all that is, yes, fatigue is probably associated in large part to uh, acidic buildup. That's simply because the enzymes responsible for energy production um, don't work well in acidic environments. So they simply stop. And even the hydrolysis or splitting part of that ATP it's the same thing. That takes an enzyme, and that enzyme doesn't work well in a really acidic environment. So you're going to start to sense that buildup of acid, and you're going to send signals to your brain that says, register that as pain and suffering. So don't do that anymore. Hmm. You're going to sort of stop. Yeah, I like that. That's, it's always great just to be able to get that, you know, almost cliff notes just because, you know, I went to school, University of Connecticut, and got... You know, green kinesiology and you know, professors are it's just so great to be able to have conversations i really feel for people today that are trying to get that from an esoteric textbook and you're seeing all your <laughs> core cycle and it's this many atp and then and then great you pass the test but then can you actually train someone can you help the athlete can you help them perform better it's like you have you know you have uh like you're saying american football player and you have them running a bunch of miles it's like no well, yeah. that's you know you gotta look at the duration the intensity of the sport and i think that's why i'm so fascinated with with, with what you do as well with mma athletes because that's probably one of the harder athletes because you're you're right in the middle of 
anaerobic, anaerobic. And so like, if you just trained aerobically, well, you need to have that maximal intensity when you're grounding and pounding and, and, and doing that. So, you know, for the next little, little block, I wanted to get more insights on how you specifically will work with your MMA fighters and, and what have you found with the current you know, science and protocols that have been the most efficient to helping them. And it also, it is, it's always case by case. If you have someone who's more aerobic, maybe you need to challenge them in a different way. But just talking a little bit more about that, I think would be really fascinating. Yeah, it is an incredibly tricky sport. One of the reasons I became so interested in it many, many years ago is for that exact thing. Is it just didn't fit with the descriptions in the exercise physiology textbooks of um, it is, you know, sometimes two to eight second complete physical exertions, maximal outputs, full body contractions. Think of like the wrestling exchanges, right? Trying to defend your life from someone trying to get on top of you and beating your face in. Um, that's, that's, that's different than blocking a guy on a football field because I played college football. I know it's, there's just nothing like it, right? Defending your physical health is, is quite different. Um, in a sport where no one's going to help and stop you. That's the point. In fact, they're cheering for it to happen. It's very, very different. But you got to repeat that over and over again for five minutes. And then you get a little bit of a break and you have to do that five more times. So it's just simply, it's 25 minutes, 30 minutes total of, of work, which is, you know, supposed to be on this other end of the spectrum of aerobic. And then it's, but it's also, you know, five second burst, but then it's also the, the glycolytic and other stuff because you're going to be doing sometimes 20 or 30 second grappling exchanges. So it's just very, very difficult to prepare for. So like, would you, one of the things that we do a little differently with our prep course is we're trying to get people, we get people to pass. It's pretty easy. And the second part is, well, let's, let's try to get some application because I know you like that video. So like comment and subscribe. If you're trying to pass that CSCS, you are getting one step closer. Email us at info at showupfitness.com. We will send you a link for our live classes that we have bi-weekly. Our study guide will get you to pass the CSCS two months, then get into an internship, a mentorship, and gain the hands-on experience. You need supervision. Keep showing up.